Hey folks, Steve here, and let's talk Balibo. Um, what is Balibo? Um, Balibo is not a distant cousin of the Babadook. Balibo isn't a what, it's a where, and um, it's it's a true story um, of uh, uh, four, five Australian journalists who um, were killed, um, sort of basically reporting and doing their job in uh, East Timor. And it's uh, it, it's a really fantastic movie. It's really gripping. And um, as you can see by this poster, it's based on a true story. The film stars Anthony Paglia, um, you know, sort of um, known and well, somewhat popular um, Australian actor. And Oscar Isaac. Uh, yeah, it's another Australian film with an international actor, and um, if you if you cast Oscar Isaac now in an Australian film, it would be considered a, a great coup because Oscar Isaac is a big time movie star, um, but he appeared in Balibo two thousand nine before he was a big star, uh, before he was cast in Star Wars. Um, I'd like to say more about Oscar Isaac in Star Wars. But I don't watch Star Wars movies myself. Um, it, it's nothing against Star Wars or people who watch Star Wars. Um, I just don't care to uh, watch Star Wars. That's all. And uh, if you like Star Wars and you enjoy it, um, good job. But um, I don't. So I haven't seen Oscar Isaac in Star Wars, so I can't really uh, say anything about that. But um, he's also in another film, which I do love which is called Inside Lewin Davis, where he sings. He's got a lovely um, singing voice. Uh, the Coen Brothers, one of my uh, favourite Coen Brothers movies. And if you know anything about me and my love for the Coen Brothers, for me to say it's one of their great movies is a, um, you know, that, that's a big thing. That's a big thing to say. So Oscar Isaac, he does Balibo before he was really recognised as a, a big movie star. He's really, really good in this. And, uh, you know, it might be worth watching if you're a Star Wars fan. Uh, you know, even more reason to engage with Balibo and um, one of its stars, Oscar Isaac, um, who is really good. Uh, I think I've said that about five times how good he is. So I'll shut up about that. Anthony LaPaglia is also uh, very good. This was kind of his return home movie because he um, he went to America and he did, a, I think, a show called Without a Trace. Um, and he was also in Frasier, as uh, he was something in Frasier. I think he, I think he actually played an Australian in Frasier. I could be wrong about that. Or maybe a pom. Uh, anyway, I don't think he played an American. Um, I suppose is the best I can say there. All right, let's get on with uh, what we're here to talk about. So uh, Saskia Sasson, she says there's basically two dynamics um, driving globalization. Um, I mean, she calls a sort of, you know, where, um, say, Ben Goldsmith calls um, globalization internationalization. She sort of calls it globalization, but uh, those two terms are quite interchangeable. Um, so don't let them confuse you. But she says there's basically two, two different ways of thinking about the international Australian cinema. There's one, the explicitly global institutions and processes, right? So what we're talking about there are the sort of the foreigners and the foreign money and the foreign production coming to Australia and working with Australians to make international movies. Um, Mad Max Fury Road would be a good example of that, where you've got international money coming in. It's a co-production. It's set up as a co-production, right? Those films are, you know, that we know what those films are. They're very popular. But she says there's another one, and the other one relates specifically to a film like Balibo where she says it's a denationalizing of national policy and the de and really the national cinema. So what she's saying is just for a film to be international doesn't require um, you know, a, 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 an international co-production or a lot of money coming in from you know, other places or an exhibition or distribution deal already set up with, say, you know, Hollywood um, you know, exhibition company or anything like that. She just thinks it's actually it's a more of an internal thing that Australians and Australian filmmaking thinks of itself in a very international way, right? And a lot of the stories that we're telling and the way that we're telling them is done in a very international way. 
in order to appeal not just to an international market, but to the the inter, the internal international in Australia. You know, the Australians are a part of the international world, and they want to actually see films that have a international relevance. Right. Um, so, what she's really arguing is this: you know, national versus international, right? Is not like it's not a battle. It's not a battle between the national and the international. Um, you know, where some people just want to make national films, which are specifically nationally Australian, and other people want to make these international films, which have nothing to do with Australian nation. She's saying it's not true because every national film has an international, every international has a national, and they're both the same. It's actually thinking about them and finding um, the the international and the national in every Australian film. Okay, so Australian films have continued to be international, and uh, guys, I don't want to toot my own horn here. But I have written on this, um, you know, in a number of um, uh, academic outlets, uh, you know, a, a pretty accessible paper would be um, the American Combine. Uh, I'm more interested in writing on um, Australia and Hollywood's relationship. But uh, I'm, just, um, I'm just referencing that because it, it sort of gives you an insight into the history of of Australia's international relationships. This isn't something new, and I think it's important just to get that um, set up quite um, early, which I'm doing now. You don't have to read my paper. I'm just saying that this is a historical thing and it's always been in existence. And if you want evidence of that, uh, you can start by reading my paper where I reference a number of other people who are also writing this era. Okay. So, what are we talking about apart from me, um, you know, trying to push my own? Um, publication. Well, uh, what we're talking about is not evidently global films, right? The films that are happening at a national scale, right? So a film like Balibo, you know, it's not a high budget film. It's not an international co-production. It's a, it's a independent, it's a low budget film, right? Um, and like that film, and like a lot of in, in independent films and smaller films, they're still attempting to attract a large international and national audience. Okay, All films are trying to do the same thing. Now, the scale and the demographic might change, but they're all trying to do the same thing, which is appeal to international and national audiences. And Balibo is certainly um, attempting to do that. So, um, you know, like I said, instead of looking um, for the national and international, let's look for the international in the national, right? So a film like Bal Balibo, how's it international? A film like, say, a, you know, The Sapphires or a Mad Max or something like that, what's national about them? And I, I think that's, um, it, it's kind of an interesting way of thinking about what we're really talking about here. Now, what I'm trying to set up and what's really going on is the messiness right of the production reality and the you know the in industrial reality now the messiness i find to be really exciting because a, a messy industry means it's diverse it's complicated it can't be easily defined and pigeonholed and what this allows us to do is come up with many many different ways of thinking about the national australian industry and that's very exciting for people to be part of it Today, it's not a decision of, well, you know, I want an international career, so I'll have to sort of, um, you know, get on the boat and sail to America and never to return, right? Like, you know, someone like Errol Flynn. Um, you know, what's really going on is, um, you know, what Dev Verhoeven talks about as the national, um, you know, the Australian national film people being happily embedded in both a, a local and an international industry, right? Happily embedded, where you can actually do, you can make international films in Australia and you can also go overseas if you choose. Okay, now denationalization fragments the national and international audience. So really what I want to talk about is when we talk about globalization and denationalization and internationalization, it's it, it's like people who really want to protect the national myth and the national idea, right? They get very, very worked up because it's like they think that people who talk about the internationalization are just talking about all the positive things about it. And what I want to talk about today is 
it's not all positive. If you denationalize a film, if you denationalize an industry, right, then what you're essentially doing is you're taking away the national importance and the national significance, right? Everything is leveled. Everything is treated the same. And you see this at the cinema. If you go and see an Australian movie, right, you're paying the same amount of cash to see an Australian movie as you are an international movie. The exhibitor, right, will not keep playing a national film, an Australian film, if it's not doing well at, you know, at the cinema. They will not keep playing it just because it happens to be Australian, right? They will play films that are popular. So again, this is a real problem for denationalizing films and internationalizing films where suddenly, right, there is no significance to them beyond, you know, above like say the American um, movies. Right, now the competition increases in order to have the films seen right? Because everything is the same and you're now competing directly with all the films from overseas, right? Um, this is detrimental to national producers. Now, um, as, I, as I talk about in uh, my reference paper is, you know, what you actually have in the early period of the cinema before like the Americans came in, all the international films, was a very national industry because we weren't getting imports from overseas. We were actually making our own movies, people were going to the movies. So the experience of watching movies at the cinema in Australia up to, you know, the 19, sort of 1915 and beyond was actually watching Australian movies. So that's very much not the case anymore. The case of now of going to the movies is actually watching, you know, your big budget movies. Okay, so I'm going to throw some um, some graphs at you, um, which are, are kind of interesting to talk through. So, 10 years ago, there were 33 fewer films competing for similar number of, number of screens. So, I'm sort of setting this up by saying the um, Balabo is a good movie, but a, an unsuccessful, commercially unsuccessful movie. All right, and... Um, we're trying to work through why that is. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you some stats in a couple of minutes as to why it is uh, unsuccessful. But this is the thing, right? So you've got a uh, 33% increase in the amount of movies being made, right? That's 33% more films are competing for exhibition space. That's theatrical exhibition plot space, a space to get the film seen, right? You've got um, a increase in the screens, right? So you've got more films and you've got an increase in the screens, but not 33% um, increase in, in screens, just 5.8%, right? But the problem of this is they're building more cinemas, they're building more screens, but you know what they're doing? They're building the... Uh, uh, you know, the the, the, the plush, um, gold class experience. This is what the multiplexes think we all want to do. We want to we want to sit in some reclining chair, which is big, that we can basically, I don't know, fall asleep in. Um, you know, those massive chairs that, like, you know, your big multiplexes. Um, and what that means is, is less seats. They can actually get less seats. So this is always, um, a, you know, it's kind of a ploy, isn't it, to make you pay for um, more money for your ticket because it's not just um, sitting on a, you know, a relatively comfortable seat. Now it's all about the reclining seat. Um, and that's a real problem. So you've got 33% more films. You've got 5.8% more screens, but you've got... Um, Minus 5.5% 5. 5. 5 fewer seats. So this is going to be a real problem in getting uh, people into Australian films or getting Australian films into um, those cinemas if, um, if that's what you're competing with. Now, this is the thing. So um, this is the um, films released on a hundred plus screens. Now, uh, Balibo didn't get released on a hundred plus screens. Now, what do we mean by hundred plus screens? Are uh, you know, if if like a multiplex has say seven screens in it, um, you know, um, and 
say, the, a Star Wars film opens, it might be in five of the seven multi on, on five of the seven multiplex screens, you know, around the country. So you know, you might end up seeing it open on you know hundreds and hundreds of screens. Now, Australian films, right? Um, there was 191 films, Australian films, that opened on more than 100 screens. In 2012-2014, uh, there were 284 films, right? So what you've actually got is more films competing for a smaller share of the box office, right? So all the films want to open big on a lot of screens because opening weekend is where you make all your money. But the problem is, like I said, there's fewer there's fewer um, seats to get people into, which is not going to help the overall box office. And films released on 100 plus screens is you've got 108 films um, from 2003 to 2005. Um, and a similar number of films taking a greater share of the box office. So what what's happening now with the, uh, you know, the franchise films and things like that is say Star Wars will just completely kill for a month where, you know, the multiplexes are basically giving all of their screens to the one film. There's not a lot of diversity and Australian films are not doing well because how can they compete? You know, how can a film like Balibo compete with a film like Star Wars? Um, you know, which is a really, a real, real problem, um, I think. Another problem, which I've been noticing lately, is... If I go to the cinema and I see a, like a, an independent film, say, right, and then next door is some crazy loud uh, Hollywood blockbuster franchise movie, right, I spend the whole movie watching my, you know, my whole movie listening to the big crash bang loud roaring, you know, um, Hollywood film next door. So, uh, my advice to exhibitors is uh, get more soundproofing going on um, in the cinemas because I can hear the loud crash bang films um, quite easily, which is annoying for me. Okay. Now, but uh, Balibo was a box office failure. So its budget was $4.8 million, which is very, very nothing. Its opening weekend was two hundred um, six hundred thousand, which is really nothing. Its overall box office was one point three million, which is nothing. In order for Balibo just to break even, it needed to make six million at the box office, right? And it made one point three. So it, it it lost it lost heaps of money. So the real question is with a film like Balibo, is what happened? Because Balibo seems like it should be really successful. Like if you think of a film like The Sapphires. Right, that's a similar story um, of Australian film, kind of set in Australia, and then particular participants go overseas, and then they ultimately come back home. Right, Balibo is doing the same thing. Balibo is a true story. Right, Balibo is, you know, it, something that actually we should be learning about in school, but we're not. Um, so it's like we're giving you a history. So. You know, Balibo stars, um, you know, Oscar Isaac and Anthony Paglia, you know, who, who are good actors. Um, now, Balibo did everything required to become successful. You know, played at the major film festivals. It won a lot of awards. It won. It was nominated for 10 um, AFI awards. It won five. Um, Oscar Isaac, he won Best Supporting Actor. And, you know... Then his Hollywood career really took off. So, um, you know, as I, I as I said to Robert Connolly um, when I I I, um, I did a Q and A with him a couple of years ago, and I said, you know, you should take credit for um, uh, for um, you know, launching Oscar Isaac's career, and he chuckled, and he didn't deny the fact that he somewhat thinks that he is um, Oscar Isaac is somewhat indebted to him. Anyway, uh, it won a number of awards, and um, so that's all good. So you think, with all of that, the film's going to do really well because we're teaching Australians about a, you know, a history, uh, not in Australia, but, you know, Australians aren't that interested in Australian history, it seems. You know, Gallipoli, 
you know, break a Moran. Like, these aren't films about Australian history in Australia. So why doesn't this film do well? Now, Balibo's problem was, you know, there's a number of problems with the film, right? Balibo's problem was its distribution in various exhibition fields. So in some places it played in multiplexes, but like I said, it's competing with, you know, all these big budget um, Hollywood films. In other places it played in independent cinemas. Its national opening was simultaneous. It wasn't staggered, right? Um, which is a real problem because it's just sort of, it's playing everywhere suddenly, but there's no real strategy going on with how they want to release the film. It relied on audio piloted press and promotion. It failed to consider DVD and online arenas as much as theatrical ones, which is a real problem also. Now, this is a chart of the most um, the films most popular in their own backyard. That's our backyard. Um, so these are Australian films most popular in Australia, right? So what Australian films are most popular in Australia? Well, uh, Red Dog uh, is number one. So that made 21.47 million in Australia. Um, now, this was... Uh, done in February 2017. Um, I'm assuming uh, it's, um, I'm, you know, I'm a little surprised why uh, Mad Max Fury Road isn't there. Anyway, um, this is the thing, All right? Seven of the top, t of the, this top 10 cost more than 9 million, right? Balibo didn't, it cost four point something. I forget what it was, right? So it's not, it doesn't actually have the, the, um, the budget behind it to really, um, you know, launch itself um, as an international, you know, as a real sort of glossy kind of international film. Nine of the top ten are dramas. None have a restricted classification, right? So if you look at this, you know, in the classification guide, you know, Red Dog PG, uh, Lion PG, Sapphire's PG, and then you've got Oddball, Paper Planes, um, G, and Red Dog, True Blue. That snuck in there, didn't it? That's PG, you know. Red Dog, True Blue. Heard it's not very good. Haven't seen it myself. But, um, you know, that's number nine. So that, that did well. And uh, interestingly, The Railway Man is uh, number 10, which is an Australian film, which really has absolutely nothing to do with Australia. Anyway, Australians like that film. Okay, so uh, Balibo is rated M. So, you know, that's a problem that it's going to have. So what we're talking about is adult movies. And um, if you look at the M films, Right. Well, firstly, Tomorrow When the War Began is a teenage film. All right. So teenagers, you know, going along, um, watching an M film. The Dressmaker is, um, you know, pretty much a comedy, as is, uh, because I'm a kind of comedy love story. And Last Cab to Darwin is also um, kind of comedy love story. Last Cab to Darwin, highly recommend it, ladies and gentlemen, if you get a chance to see it. Um, I was very impressed by it. Uh, okay, the cast of six of the top ten are very popular locally. Right, now, Oscar Isaac, today, like I said, you know, that would be that would be a big deal to get him in one of your films, all right? But, um, you know, he wasn't known at the time, and Anthony LaPaglia, yeah, he's kind of a TV actor. Yeah, he's good, but, you know, I don't really think people are running off to see Anthony LaPaglia movies, are they? Am I being too harsh? I don't think I'm being too harsh. Nine of the top ten got a wide release. So look at this. Maximum number of screens that it played on, like I was talking about before. Look at Red Dog. Opens with 245 screens. The Dressmaker on 384 screens. Lion, 245 screens, right? Look at that. Tomorrow when the war began, 342 screens. Holy mackerel. Who would have thought that? Anyway. The teen audience seemed to really like that film because they were rushing out to see it and the multiplex is delivered in spades for that film. Well, not for Balibo. Balibo opened on uh, very, very few screens. Um, I think it opened, I think the opening weekend was 50 screens and that was the best it got. By about week three, it was on like 12 screens in the country. So that's nothing. So, um, you know, again. So these are all the things that the, the Balibo didn't have. Right, it didn't have a big budget, more than nine million. It it didn't have a um a, a classification under M. Uh, it didn't have a popular cast. 
and it didn't get a wide release. So, um, you know, this is the real problem with, uh, you know, thinking about a film like Balabo and, you know, what you're actually competing with and what you essentially have to do to get a, you know, a film really popular. Balabo is a very, it's a kind of, it's a, it's, it's really great and it's gripping and it's, you know, it's really well done, but it's, it's bleak. It's, it's really, it's a really negative kind of bleak world that's being represented here. And, um, it certainly says a lot of things about um, Australia's relationship, um, you know, with other um, close countries and things like that. Um, so you don't kind of walk out of Balibo feeling good about the world. And um, I would say that all of these films are bar the Railway Man. That's a bit. That's a bit. A bit of a downer. But uh, all the other films, uh, you know, you kind of walk out with a spring in your step. The Sapphires, you probably walk out singing one of the songs. Not Balibo. So again, that's going to affect, um, you know, the popular films and the films that people actually do want to go out and pay money to see. It may depress you to hear this, but it's the truth. If you want to make a popular film, make a happy film. All right. Now, another reason why uh, Balibo doesn't work and Balibo being symptomatic for other films is the ticket increase, right? So like I said... More films are being made than ever. You've got less seats in cinemas than ever. And you've got ticket prices increasing. So if you actually look at this graph, so the the top graph uh, is going crazy. That graph's out of control. That's the top price. So, um, you know, like, look at um, the, uh, you know, the sort of the 2010 to 12 period, which is actually... Um, the reason why, you know, you've got ticket prices which are kind of almost hitting 30 bucks, that's your 3D um, craze right there. Um, 3D, what happened to that? That didn't last long, did it? Like for a while, every film was coming out. And it was, you know, there was the 3D version and the 2D version. And now there's just 2D version. So apparently um, people didn't like the 3D experience. I... Personally, have an issue with 3D because I I'm a glasses wearer. I have to put my 3D glasses over my regular glasses, so I'm I'm like double glassed up, and um, you know, the nose can only take so much glassware on it. Anyway, um, so basically, people ah oh, look at the bottom uh, the bottom one that I was going to talk about apart from my own problems with 3D. So, yeah, average price, it's just going up, right? It's consistently going up every year. And this is the problem. So you've got uh, more films to choose, less seats to choose from, and you're going to have to pay more from your hip pocket. So what film are you going to choose? Are you going to choose, you know, Happy Sing Along the Sapphires or the bleak and dark and miserable Balibo, even though Balibo is fantastic and a true story and every person interested in, um, you know, journalism should watch it because it's a film about journalism. But anyway, um, so, th you know, this is really the battle that Balibo is coming up against. Now, ticket prices, which is worth talking about, and we'll talk about it in class, is the discounting of cinema ticket prices, right? Now, I my my local, ladies and gentlemen, is a cinema called Waverley Cinema. And I want to put a plug out for Waverley Cinema because uh, the the most you pay at Waverley Cinema is ten bucks. And um, often I pay six bucks and sometimes I pay eight bucks. You know, on a on a really on a really big night I'll pay ten bucks when uh, you know, it's like maybe a Saturday night or, you know, something like that. But generally, I'm paying between six and eight. Fantastic. And uh, because of that, I get to see a lot of new films at the cinema, right? Which makes me very happy. But then you have the bastards, the exhibition bastards. And I'm going to call them that, ladies and gentlemen, because they are, you know, they bite back at these independent cinemas, you know, by, like your, your readings and your event cinemas, right? And now, this is what, like, Village have been saying. They're calling them a cancer. These are the people who are doing their darndest to give 
cheap ticket prices so you can actually go along to see a film, right, and maybe support local cinema. They're calling it a cancer, which is threatening the local industry. A cancer. That's right. So they're trying to help the local person, the local film goer, the local person interested in the local cinema, right? And they decry the pricing of tickets at 10 bucks and below as a race to the bottom. A race to the bottom? Which is undermining the value of watching films on giant screens with Dolby Atmos sound in luxurious seatings. Fuck the luxurious seatings, I say, ladies and gentlemen. I don't care about your reclining seat. I'm not interested. What I'm interested in is paying 10 bucks at Waverley Cinema for a, you know, mildly comfortable chair, right? And I'm happy. I'm away, right? Just give me the film. That's great, right? I don't want to pay 25 to 35 bucks at the multiplex to see, um, you know, a big crash bang movie. I don't want that. So, you know, shame on you for saying that it's a race to the bottom because it's not a race to the bottom. But, you know, what's what's ignored in this is that they're not actually helping Australian films, right? Because who is going to pay 35 bucks to see Balibo? Evidently, not many people because, you know, the reality is not many people went to see the movie because it only made, you know, over a million bucks and that's absolutely nothing. Right. So... Are these exhibitors really supporting local independent cinema is a question. The answer is no. So it's kind of a rhetorical question, isn't it? No. How many times do you go to the cinema? What is a fair price? How much would you pay? Now, uh, I'll tell you in another lecture the amount of people, the average amount of, that people go to the cinema, and it's not much, ladies and gentlemen. It's not much at all. So um, we should think about this, that if cinema was 10 bucks a pop, we'd probably go along to a lot more movies. So, um, bad, bad village for um, making us all feel ashamed for paying for cheap cinema prices. And um, that's all I have to say about that matter for now. But I will be back banging on about village and um, a few things that have happened to them. And um, they've, you know, put themselves in the media over very, very soon. In conclusion, final thought. So Aussie films are expected to be both global yet competitive, right? Now, without the production or marketing budgets. Now, I think that's a real problem. That, um, you know, like a film like Bella Bo, it doesn't have the production or the marketing budgets, right? But it's expected to be both global, globally competitive. And it's expected to play, say, at the multiplex and go against the big films, the big opening films. And that's becoming very, very, very difficult for the, for the local films to sustain, okay? Exhibitors make no concessions for Australian movies, right? Like I said, right? Uh, movies are forced to think and behave like global movies. And filmmakers, I think, uh, are forced to behave like global movies. So every Australian film that you see is a global film. And I want you to think about that and think about how you you can find the international in the the national films. So rather than think of internationalization as an external thing, right, or in competition with the national, it's important to consider is it as an internal mindset. How are pr productions being made, um, like you know, as global films? How are they distributed as global films, exhibited, and how are we receiving them as global films? How do we actually rate um, Australian films? How do we actually talk about them? How do we review them, right? Uh, things to think about, um, certainly for assessments. Uh, films that are identified as national are substantially oriented, oriented towards global agendas and systems, right? Now, that's fine, right? A film like Balibo, it's meant to be global. It's meant to have global agendas. It's meant to be global systems. That's all fine. But at what cost does this come? And the real question um, that we're asking this week and that the article asks this week is the problems of um, internationalization and denationalizing the local industry. And is that actually helping Australian films? Is that actually making them more competitive or making them less competitive? It's fine for a film like, say, The Piano or The Sapphires, who have big budgets, right, to actually do that. But for the really small films, it doesn't seem to be helping them to be thinking internationally on international terms. So, um, okay, I'll leave it there. 
Um, and uh, I look forward to seeing you to discuss um, uh, Balibo. And I'll, I'm looking forward to watching the film with you. It's a really, it's a really wonderful film, um, really well done. And it is a shame that it didn't do well, but the fact that it didn't do well is certainly a, um, a, com- a conversation to ponder and have. And um, I think it does sort of open up other conversations about um, uh, distribution and exhibition of Australian films and you know what's actually going on with the way that Australian films are being made in very international terms. They're also being watched and received in very international terms. And the way the exhibitor is working on very international terms and not really um, favouring the local experience and the local production either. All right, I'll leave it there. Uh, Look forward to seeing you soon. Bye for now.